Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Zoom meeting, and which is also broadcast on YouTube. My name is uh, Dami. This is my name sign. And I represent the Deaf Association from Slovenia. And I'm responsible for selecting speakers on deaf culture from all over the world and to have several deaf interpreters involved. Last week, we had a woman. Toma Kubita from Germany, who gave a very impressive presentation. Very impressive. She gave a life story, how she traveled the world on her own. And many of my friends tell me, is this possible for a deaf woman to travel the world on her own? I said, sure. I told him, sure, if you're motivated to be a lovely role model. So I invited her to present last week as a deaf role model. Now we have another woman tonight, Ruva Kramers. She's from Holland. Welcome, Ruva. The floor is yours. Hey, Ruva. Um, okay, welcome in our Zoom event. How do you feel? Wait. This is the first time I'm uh, involved in a global uh, Zoom meeting with many deaf interpreters. I've been never been in a Zoom meeting with so many interpreters. I think it's beautiful. And congratulations on achieving this. And I'm so proud to be part of it. Thank you, Dami, for your wonderful idea to set up these global Zoom meetings. And also to have deaf interpreters involved in international sign. So hats off. Again, I'm thrilled to be part of it. Thank you for the invitation. This is a bit confusing. I'm on gallery view. I see a lot of people signing now. Apologies for that. Ruka, just watch me. Dami is saying, you're okay. I'll take myself off screen and then the floor is totally yours. Welcome. My name is Ruva. My last name, Kramers. This is my sign name. I'm deaf. Can I put on the next slide, please? So again, welcome. Can I have the slide up, please?
We are a small minority in the European deaf communities. It's not easy to be a deaf Roma. Next slide, please. Next picture. I'll start this program by telling you a bit of my life story, how I grew up. I am deaf. My, I do have a deaf family members, so we do share a culture. Then I will tell you a little bit of the history of the Roma people, traveling people. I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Roma people do have a spoken language. If uh, deaf people have sign language, and of course there are Roma deaf people. I will uh, then show you a video. And at the end, there'll be a Q&A session, a question and answer session. So I was born deaf. My father and mother are deaf. And I was born in Kosovo. When I was age six, I started going to school in Kosovo. In Prizren. I will spell it P-R-I-Z-R-E-N. In the Prizren Deaf School. I was born in a city called Peja, so I traveled back and forth to school, between school and home. We were in integrated schools. In my school I had about 150 and two, or 200 students. We stayed in the dormitory and only twice a year we were allowed to go back to our families. We had different schools in Kosovo. We had schools where the instruction was taught in Albanian. In another school the language was Serbo-Croatian. But what we shared was our sign language. Uh, next slide, please. What about my people, the Roma people? Many of you, when you see the word or hear the word Roma, you think of the capital of Italy. But when I use the term Roma, it refers to my people, my tribe, my family. There is another tribe called the Sinti, who are travelers.
and our history of both tribes started way back when in India. Where we were part of the general <clears throat> population and we shared a language, both the Roma and the Sinti. In the year 800 before Christ, until 1902, or 192, so way back when, no, 19, uh, when the First World War happened, many Roma and Sinti escaped India and ended up in Europe to live in the West and the East of Europe. Many went to Romania, built a life there, built their families there and stayed. Others had a different culture. They were travelers. So they moved on into Europe, from Romania into Hungary, uh, Hungary, uh, Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, and the rest of Europe. And they ended up in France. So we ended up all over Europe. There is a difference, though, between the culture of the Roma and the Sinti. In the year 800 before Christ, well, aha, interpreter error. Uh, between four and eight hundred years ago, many of us were discriminated. And we were given a free pass to travel, a kind of free passport. So we were allowed to travel the world. The police or customs wouldn't bother us. So we were allowed to cross language borders. The Roma mostly settled in households, whereas the Sinti kept on traveling. So that's one major difference between the Roma and the Sinti. But it's also a difference between social classes between the Roma, within the Roma and within the Sinti community. I see many signs being used for Roma and Sinti, like this, gypsies, other terms, please, deaf people, we have proper signs. This is the sign for Roma. That's official, it's our sign. This sign for fiddler that many people use is really something for the hearing. Roma, the musicians you sometimes see performing on the street. But in sign language, this is the name sign for our people. And you spell it like R-O-M-A. In 1960, in London, there was a political resolution to allow Roma to live in England and have their proper identity and to give them the nationality. And increasingly, other countries in Europe started recognizing the existence of Roma. And now, Still, many people, especially in the deaf community, are unaware of Roma culture. Hearing people are becoming increasingly aware, but deaf people, many, there are still confusions about our existence. And that's one of the reasons why I'm proud to be here and share you part of my life story. A 
Uh, the next slide, please. Here in Roma, have their own language. Likewise, Roma people have their own sign language. And both are beautiful languages. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought here. Let me go back to my notes. One second, please. I'm sorry, I was just, I just lost my train of thoughts here. So both deaf and hearer, hearing Roma have, we have our own languages. Roma sign language is beautiful. But when we meet hearing Roma people, it becomes a very impoverished gesture form of communication. So there is communication possible, but it's not very in-depth. In Kosovo, sign language is still being researched. It's not been recognized as a language. But I just want to let you know that Roma deaf people have our own sign language. And one day, I'm sure our language will be recognized. One day in the future. Can we show the video, please, dummy? Uh, almost there. It's almost there. A uh, dummy here. Let just the technician give the technician a few seconds to start the video again. I'm sorry. Let's stop my heart for a second. So you're now going to watch a two minute video. The Rome, Roma people, there's around 10,000 in Europe and only 20,000 in France. In France, there's talk of many people. Many people think that Roma don't want to integrate or they're immigrants just coming here for social security. And that's the kind of image we get on television. But I'm, I chose to spend some time with Roma people. Uh, the family Adovic, Radomir, and Stanka. They have 11 children, four are deaf, and they've been living here for the past two years.
So what you've just seen in this video is the culture of deaf Romans. Most of them were not educated at all. They've been living in several places in Europe, meeting many barriers, especially had no access to education. So many deaf Roma who ended up in a place, remained unemployed, were thrown out of the country, be it to France, to Italy, to other places. As you just saw in the video, there was this family who arrived in France and yet had to learn another language. Some of them had to go to school in Germany, learn a bit of German, were thrown out of the country, had yet to learn another spoken language and another sign language. So why is it that there is no good education? Part of the reason is that we, many, many Romas, we're scattered all over the place with communication problems, broken family ties, and without access to education at all. Of course, on top of that, they also suffer, we also suffer from the lack of respect for deaf culture and deaf communities in many European countries. So life for many Roma deaf people is not good in Europe. But we have to live on. And we will. But we're very certain, uncertain about our future. Can I have the next picture, please? All right, let me step in here, Dami. Can we have a change for the deaf interpreters, please? Can we have the next team of deaf interpreters step in? Okay. It looks that all the interpreters are back on. Riva, back to you. For many Roma deaf children, life is hard. Looking back at my own life, I was very lucky to be allowed in, in the Prisbrin deaf school. My parents lived in Preja, a town in Kosovo. And I was lucky to go to enter school when I was only six years old. I had an older deaf and brother who were already enrolled in school. So as the third deaf child in the family it was kind of easy. When I entered the deaf school first, it was the first time that I saw deaf children who didn't know how to sign. I had the language from home. My father and mother had talked to me and signed to me from the moment I was born. So I was raised with the language. Now I arrived at a deaf school and I saw my peers not knowing any sign language. So I, I taught them sign language. The education was oral. So it was us, the children, that had to teach our teachers how to sign. We simply copied what the teachers wrote on the blackboard without understanding what was going on or what it meant. But amongst herself, we signed.
my brothers were teased and bullied for being Roma. My oldest brother graduated from school. After a while, my second brother became the one who was bullied and discriminated for being deaf and being a Roma. He coped quite well and graduated school. Now the third deaf child was me. I was the last one in school. And again, both adults and children started bullying me and oppressing me, discriminating me. I suffered a lot. I was always happy to spend the two school holidays a year with my family at home. And during the holidays, I told my parents I wasn't happy at school. I was being discriminated. I was bullied for being a Roman. I asked my parents, why do they bully us? My father always said, Ruva, do not be afraid. Yes, you can come out as a Roma woman. We have, you have your language, you have your culture. You do not have to change because you're a Roma. You don't have to pretend that you're a Catholic Jehovah Witness or a Muslim, don't. We've given birth to you. You have your human, human rights. Stand up for yourself. They asked the same question to my mother. And my mother said, if somebody bullies you, slap him in the face. And I told mom, okay, if a girl teases me, I can slap her in the face, but can I do this to a man? My father told me, no, don't slap people, don't hit people. You're beautiful, your aroma. Don't be violent. So I had the dilemma. My mother told me it was okay to hit people if they bullied me. My father told me I shouldn't. So I didn't know what to do. I followed my mother's advice. I was going to be a strong Roma woman. After that holiday, when I came back to school, I felt very confident. Again, children and adults alike bullied me, like, you're a Roma, you're a Roma. So, poof, I hit the first child who bullied me. Of course, there's now laws that forbid uh, violence. But in my days, I just... Well, that legislation didn't exist. Then I got bullied for people saying, yeah, Roma people are very violent. And I just came out. I said, my, par my parents were proud of me. Likewise, you, if you're born Catholic, your parents are proud of you. If your parents are Albanian, they're proud of you. Why bully me for being a Roma? At age 11, I really started standing up for myself. I was discriminated and bullied by many children and adults alike. But at the same time, I was the one who introduced sign language to many of them. I was the sign language teacher. One year, Christmas holiday came and it was time for me to go back home to my family for the Christmas holidays. I remember the day, it was the 12th of December. I went back to my parents' house, back to my father, mother, my brothers. And my father looked at me really with a weird look on his face. 
And my father told me, Riva, it's very important that you stay in power. You cannot be weak. You are important. You got your life from your mother and me and from our culture. Learn to read and write, get your diplomas, find work. Find a good man. We will support you. So I was looking at my dad, wondering why he told me all this. Yes, I knew school was important. Graduating was important. Finding work was important. Being open about me being deaf and aroma. Yes, I wanted a family. So I told my dad, yes, I will do all this. Why are you telling me this? The next day, my father died. I felt such a loss. Yesterday, I've had this deep conversation with my father. It was very short, but very meaningful. And I felt so uncertain about the future. I always counted on my family living forever, counted on their support. And now I realized that my life was going to change dramatically and my path was going to change. Next slide, please. Uh, excuse me, that was the wrong slide. Can we go back? India? Can we back, go back to the picture in from India? Thank you. The picture you just saw was kind of a slum of Roma and or Sinti who lived in India. In slums, favelas. In Roma culture, the man is always in charge. It's a very patriarchal community. Women stay at home, take care of the children, the food, the cooking, the laundry. Women are not allowed to go out of the house. If your husband comes, out, comes home and finds out that you've visited even another Roma family, the man has the right to slap you to abuse you. It's the woman's role to stay at home, take care of the kids and the food. So men are allowed even in Roma culture to abuse the woman physically. Now, if you're deaf and a woman Suppose you marry, you get children. Even if you're a Roma husband, he will discriminate you and abuse you even more. Suppose as a woman, you haven't cooked, the, the meal isn't ready on time, a man will abuse you. When a man comes home and sees the food isn't ready yet, He will physically abuse the woman terribly. So women have to be subservient. 
So now both Deaf Man and Deaf Roma have a tradition of abusing their wives. There's a lot of discrimination and oppression of women. So for a Deaf Roma woman, life's not good. You can only hope for a better future. But you always have to show respect to the guys. If a man is discriminated, if uh, your husband discriminates you or is violent with you, there's a big risk that you start abusing your own children. Because we're really raised with the idea that it's okay, that it's normal to be abused. So in my culture, and within my family, there was a lot of oppression happening. Remember I told you my father passed away and I felt that my life was going to change. It did. My family thought I would continue respecting the traditions, but I decided differently. I listened to my father, stood up for myself. My oldest brother told me, your dad is dead now, now I'm in charge. And I told him, well, I graduated from school. I make my own money. I'm not going to pass all my money to you. My oldest brother already had a wife, three children, all deaf. In my brother's... Uh, no, in my mother's uh, family business, my father, my, my oldest brother already had a, a job. We had a, a home that we built ourselves. On the bottom floor in one room, my brother lived with my, with his wife. In the other house, uh, in the other room in the house, it was my, my mother and my other siblings. My mother and I worked very hard. My brother was lazy. He didn't work because he was now the oldest man. So we had to contribute money to him. And he just said, I'm the oldest. I'm the firstborn. I have to, you, the second, the younger siblings and mom, you have to support me and my family. So I saw all my hard earned money been taken away by my oldest brother. He had no life. My only purpose in life was to take care of my oldest brother, family. It was a mess. My mother and me, who had built this house, again, two rooms. We lived together under the same roof. The attic was empty. There was no money to further expand the house. And all our work, all the money we earned went to support my brother and his children and his wife. We felt life was wasted. Just because for cultural reasons, my brother held that position in the family. He was oppressing us. I started having a serious series of uh, arguments with my brother. I cried. I was bullied by other Roma people. <clears throat> For being a woman, 18 years old, not even married. Because girls are supposed to get married in my culture at age 13, 14, or 15. When you're 16 or 17, you're supposed to have your first child and breastfeed. Now here I was 18, unmarried. My mother, no, actually my oldest brother and my second brother and my mother 
wanted me to get married because the groom's family has to pay money to the family of the bride. In Roman culture, marriage is arranged. You're not allowed to fall in love, pick your own partner. And my brother and family was only interested in the money they could get from me. You have to get married and on the wedding night, you have, after the wedding night, you have to show the sheets. After the wedding night, you have to show the blood of a woman losing your virginity in order to show that you were a virgin married. And then everybody will applaud you, will be happy. That's the Roman culture. And I couldn't do that. I did not want to respect that cultural tradition. I said, no, you have to respect my body, my life. I will pick my own partner. My brother told me you can't. My family told me you have to marry a Roma, Riva. And you best marry a deaf Roma man. And I said, me marrying a deaf Roma man? I looked at the Roma deaf man around. There were none. And the few that there were, were either Catholic, Muslim, Orthodox. And those men weren't interested in marrying a Roma woman. They wanted to have a woman they could oppress, look down on, abuse. And don't forget the fact that uh, I'm lucky I wasn't raped, but rape is very much part of Roma culture. I was lucky that I was strong enough. I was lucky that my mom told me that when I was in a deaf school, that there were approximately roughly 20 to 30 Roma kids in my deaf school as part of the 200 students population. Of course, there, was, there were Albanian deaf kids, Serbian deaf kids, but about 20 to 30 Roma deaf kids. And in that, from that 20 or 30, half dropped out of school. And my deaf Roma women, female friends, one after the other, got raped or disappeared. Disappeared. The, the next one got married, age 13, had to drop out of school without graduating. So my aim in life was to obey my father, graduate. All my other Roman friends, especially the women, dropped out of school, got married, had children, babies, two, three. By the time they were 17 or 18. And here I was, 18, I met my former school friends. And they were proud. They had a family, they were married, they had children. And they looked at me like, what about you? What's wrong with you? And I told them, uh-uh. You're not educated. Sure enough, you respected your family values and traditions. I haven't, but I will find my own path in life. So I lost one friendship after the other. So deaf women are lost to life because they get married. Once they get divorced, they end up with horrible lives, with their kids, no husband, no education, being abused, without work, without money. 
So it's hard for women to get work, for deaf women to get work, let alone for a Roma deaf woman to find work. They're triple, triple discriminated. They're more abused, more bullied. They have no life. That's how life is. So, and that's how the discrimination of deaf people, deaf Roma, and deaf Roma women has been throughout history. I have learned to stand up for myself. I was lucky. Yeah. Okay, it's time for a swap between the deaf interpreter teams. Perfect. All our deaf interpreters are ready again. Perfect. Ruga, floor is back to you. Uh, next slide, please. You may have recognized the flag, the flag of Switzerland. I lived there for 11 years and felt, and that's where I got empowered. So how did I end up living in Switzerland? Back to Kosovo, I had my family struggles. There was a lot of pressure on me to respect the Roma culture. I, re I rebelled and for the first time went to Switzerland to work in a restaurant one year. After one year and three months, I was deported and sent back to Kosovo from Switzerland, all the way back to where I came from. I returned to Switzerland the second time, got deported again. And the third time I was finally given permission to stay in Switzerland. I had a job, I was employed. They entered a deaf club and they asked the people there to ask me to, to educate me to learn to read and write Swiss, but the Swiss deaf people didn't help me at all. They said, you're a refugee, why would we help you? I said, wait, you're deaf like me, why wouldn't you help me? And they told me, we don't care, you're from Kosovo, we don't care. So three times I was deported out of Switzerland, caught by the police, been imprisoned for two months, Sent back to Kosovo, I ran back to Switzerland. And only the third time when I returned to Switzerland, I was allowed to stay. Deaf, the Swiss deaf people wouldn't help me. And this is hard. I got help from some hearing that, from hearing Swiss people. I was offered a job here, there. I built up a hearing network. Some hearing Swiss people, they like me, my way of communicating, my, I guess, charisma. So I was really able to build up work experience, but I've never integrated in the Swiss deaf community. My whole network existed of hearing people. And in Switzerland, there's a whole international 
crowd of people who live and work in Switzerland. And that was my crowd. This is where I get work experience and develop myself. I've lived in two places in Switzerland. The first one is Zurich. This is the sign name of Zurich. The second place I lived in Switzerland is more in the south in a town called Zermatt in a ski resort. It's a place where many people come to celebrate the holidays, to come skiing or snowboarding. So it's very, it's very high up in the mountains. So it's called Zermatt. And Zurich, again, here's the sign name for Zurich. That, those are two places where I live. In Zurich, summer, I stayed in summer for roughly six months. But when the fall season, the winter season came, I moved to, to Zermatt, because then the ski pistes would open up. And that's when I had my winter jobs. I want to show you some pictures of that period. Next slide, please. As you may have seen from the pictures, in Zermatt I used to work evenings, from 11 in the evening till 4, 5 in the morning, and then my job will be done. I worked as a waitress in a restaurant. I received a lot of support from the local people in Zermatt. Nobody ever talked to me about my ability to speak or my lack of ability to speak. They would sign to me, gesture to me, to anybody I came across. If somebody would talk to me, I would just show my ignorance face. And some of my co-workers would tell that person, hey, this lady doesn't talk, sign. And the young person would say, how do I communicate with her? And my colleague would then teach them some signs. Like, this is the sign for beer. And the hearing people would gesture. And I would respond. And if they made the sign that looked like the gesture for beer, I would serve them one. So we taught hearing guests, different signs, beer, wine, etc. In that sense, my life in Zermatt was beautiful. Zermatt is a very international crowd. People who work there come from England, France, the United States, Japan, Holland, Yugoslavia. The workers there are very international. So I worked in two places, twice a year, in Zermatt, six months, Zurich, six months. And I was lucky to meet a Dutch guy in Zermatt. And we happened to stay in the same hotel. And we happened to work in the same restaurant. So we met, we became friends, we fell in love. And this was mutual. We, he taught me to snowboard and other friends helped me to snow, to improve my snowboarding techniques. And I'm an okay snowboarder since then. 
Well, so it works in the evening, like I said, from 10 till the morning, four or five o'clock. When I was finished, I would go to bed, catch a nap till 10, 11, get dressed, and then bring my snowboard up the mountain, snowboard down until it was time to go to work. So after this half year, snow starts melting in Samots, winter season is over. I had to go back to Zurich to live and work there for summer. And the Dutch guy I met moved back to Holland, kept thinking about me, jumped in his car, drove to Switzerland, to Zurich, went looking for me. And when I saw him, I was so surprised. I said, hey, we worked together in Samart. And he said, yeah, but we met for half a year. I was really thinking of you and to be my girlfriend. So we met time and time again for three years. We had a long distance relationship, him and Holland, me in Zurich. And after three years, he told me, I, I love you. I'm in, in love with you. You want to marry me? Before this moment, I always thought I'm deaf, I'm a woman, I'm a Roma. Hmm. I'll go through life as best as I can. Here's this man who wanted to marry me. And I said, first of all, I'm not rich. Then I'm a Roma and I'm deaf. And the man said, who cares? I know you for three years already. You've learned to communicate. I love you. I'm in love with you. And the man said, told me, do you want to get ma marry me? Yes or no? Because we know each other for three years. I think we're good. I told him yes. He did his paperwork. I did my paperwork. We got married in plain clothes, very normal everyday outfit. I never before this moment thought I would ever marry a uh, Mary, uh, hearing man. Okay, on to the next slide and life after marriage. As you've seen in the picture, some typical Dutch culture, windmills and all, I moved my life, started living in Holland, became part of my husband's family. And I live in the south of Holland, in a province called Limburg. So that's where I moved to live with my husband. But my job was in Eindhoven. I'll spell it for you, E-Y-N-D-H-O-V-N. And it's the name sign for that town, Eindhoven. So I had to commute. My husband was commuting back and forth to work. So we decided to move to Eindhoven. And in Dutch culture, I learned so much. 
are so empowered. Because when you come into Holland, you have to take um, courses to learn Dutch, to read it, to write it. And I connected to the Dutch Deaf Association, learned a lot about politics, deaf politics, advocacy. It was very different from my life in Switzerland, where I mainly socialized with the hearing people. Now in Holland, uh, in Kosovo, I mainly mingled with deaf people, but they were illiterate. Now in Switzerland, I mingled, hang out mostly with hearing people. Now in Holland, I had a chance to do everything, to learn, read and write Dutch, meet people, deaf people, signing, educated, I learned so much. I started asking around in the Dutch deaf associations and deaf clubs, saying, do you know of other deaf Roma? In the beginning they were confused. They didn't understand my question even. Hearing people knew about the existence of Roma, deaf people didn't. I tried to give them some information. I uh, started feeling disempowered. I lost my energy. Then I contacted other deaf refugees and applied for a job training deaf refugees to become Dutch citizens. To integrate in Dutch society, to teach them about Dutch hearing culture. To respect Dutch culture. I mean, if you move into Holland as a migrant, you have to learn and work to learn the Dutch deaf culture, to become part of Dutch culture. So that's the job I did for many years. And it gave me so much satisfaction, so much experience, so much knowledge. In the back of my head, I always thought, oh, what do I do with my knowledge? I have two children, they're starting to grow up. So I asked my husband, what do I do with all my experience? in the Dutch deaf community. Uh, I want to go back and work in Kosovo. My husband told me I was right. If a deaf, Ro as a deaf Roma woman, yes, why don't you go out and establish an association for deaf Roma? At that point in time, I remember my father. One day, Riva, you will go into deaf politics. You will set up an association. You will be liberating a lot of deaf Roma people and women. So I felt so happy. In Holland, there's many Roma women, but deaf Deaf Roma women were lacking so far behind. So how to catch up? I saw Deaf Roma being in, integrated in Dutch culture. I saw strong Roma women. Can I can show me the next slide, please? Time for an interpreter swap, please. Deaf interpreters? Okay, you're all good. Back to Riva. Uh, hold on. Keep the slide on, please. One second. In the pictures you just saw,
those were pictures of how I became empowered in Holland by hearing Roma women who taught me so much, gave me so much self-confidence. Hearing women in Roma managed to recruit a filmmaker. who filmed 320 Roma people and Sinti people. And then the Dutch Roma women told him that we know of a deaf Roma woman. He became interested, set up a meeting with me and said, you're a Roma, right? And I said, yes, which would be part of my documentary. And he said, What's my story? He said, well, I've interviewed many hearing Roma women, but it's the first time I meet a deaf Roma woman. We clicked, I told him my story, he made notes. We met for two times for long interviews. Then the filming started and I was able to tell my life story and share it. In two interview sessions. The documentary was shown on TV I've been to the Rode Loper, um, which is a debate cafe in Amsterdam, twice. And when I saw the movie for the first time, I saw myself on the big screen. I was there with my two children and my husband, and my children saw their mother on screen and saw mom's life story. And I saw my children burst into tears when I heard my life story of discrimination and how I became the strong woman I am now. My children also thanked my father or my husband, their father. And they thanked through me, my father for empowering me. So I'm very proud of having been part of that movie. One woman portrayed in the documentary was a professional award-winning dancer, very famous. Another Roma woman was a musician, a singer. And the third woman was a deaf Roma woman, myself, telling about Roma culture, deaf culture, with pride. So I'm very proud to have been one of the three women portrayed in the documentary. Next slide, please. About my ambition to become politically active. So why become politically active? There's many Roma people who are active politically, but so far no deaf Roma woman have become politically active. So I wanted to establish a deaf Roma association in a positive spirit where everybody will be equal, men, women, children, and adults alike. And I'd always been thinking about the EUD, the European Union of the Deaf, with their headquarters in Brussels. And I've known and attended EUD meetings for 10, 15 years. So one day I approached them and said, you are a European level organization of deaf people. Aren't you forgetting though about deaf Roma minorities? And the EUD told me, you're right. 
this is the first time we see it meets a death Roma and hear about your whole situation. We are a hundred percent behind you. We know nothing about you. You're the first that ever came, approached us. Get involved. So I told him I wanted to establish for the future generations a Roma Deaf Association for our children, for the future. And the EUD fully accepted my proposal. They asked me if I was interested in becoming an EUD board member. And I said, no, sorry, I'm alone. I'm coming to you for help. Because deaf Roma women and men, we are rare and we have no one standing up as a politician. And the EUD told me, what? I never thought deaf Roma would be in the closet. Eh? I told them I'm honest. So that was my next step. The EUD told me I could not become a board member, but our door is open. You're welcome to come and observe our meetings. And I told them, I need your information. And the EUD told me, sure. So they gave me information about their meetings. And on an EU level, the EUD had contact, brought me in contact with an EU level Roma organization. Maybe some of you know the director of the EUD, Mark Wheatley. He's helped me so much. Another deaf leader I'd like to thank is Helga Stevens, a former member of the European Parliament, who also gave me information about Roma organizations. So I'm very grateful to both Mark and Helga, who allowed me to finally attend a Roma European conference. I had people who helped me translate my applications, etc. in English. And I was told at the conference, oh, again, oh, we didn't know of the existence of deaf Roma women. Very welcome. I, again, for the first time, was involved in an EU Roma meeting as an observer. And I heard women talk about the EU Roma culture, life of Roma people in the EU. We had three fabulous female interpreters. Hearing speakers were telling negative stories about how difficult life was. Others presented a more positive picture. Most emphasized discrimination. And I was thinking back about my life experience and I realized that also hearing Roma people are being discriminated. And I realized again that it's important to realize that for deaf Roma people, there's even more discrimination, there's multiple discrimination. So this went on in my head after when watching these presentations. And afterwards, I went up to the speakers and said, some of you presented the positive aspects of Roma life, some the negative. Some emphasized the cultural tradition, culture we have. Some of you discussed the needs and the improved educational situation for Roma children. But what about deaf Roma? What about deaf Roma women? And all of them told me, well, you're the first one we meet. And I told them, 
as a Roma European community, you failing us as deaf people. Many of us face educational barriers. And the hearing speakers told me, you're right, Ruba. They asked me, do you have a, a deaf Roma association? I told them no. And the reason is, I don't have the money to travel. Can you create a project with funding? So I started building my network, started connected to people. I approached the EUD. I could attend their political meetings. And he told me I was welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. So at EUD, I saw presidents of national deaf associations. I met wonderful high deaf people in high positions. I, in 2000 and let me think, uh, five years ago. <laughs> In 2015, I attended my first World Congress in Istanbul, met again, very high level deaf presenters, made many connections that last until today. So now I know I feel connected to presidents of national deaf associations throughout the EU. And I approached one after the other and asked them, do you know Roma, Roma deaf people? Some, yes. Many know. And I told them, I, we need a European Deaf Roma Association. So now I have two parallel, let's say, networks. One in Deaf Europe, delegates who know me also. And I have a hearing network in Holland. Some also are connected on a European level. So they both help me, both networks, to advocate for deaf romance. I would also like to invite sign, ling sign linguists to look into the deaf Roma sign language. through the network of national presidents of national deaf associations, I'm trying to raise awareness about um, the existence of deaf Roma, about the unemployment on the deaf Roma, about the abuse happening among deaf Roma, about the lack of employment and educational opportunities for deaf Roma. So I really hope now that with this network the EUD and my hearing Roma network I hope to be a role model for deaf Roma and to lift up the Roma deaf community to improve life opportunities for deaf Roma kids so one because one day I'll be old retired and I want to see successful deaf Roma to wave the deaf Roma flag one day. That's the future I want to see. And that's the future I'm trying to achieve. That's how I try to work in my way to stop discrimination of deaf Roma people. I feel lucky. I've given three lectures at European events. The first in Valencia, in Spain. On a European Deaf Women Congress, where I was asked to give a presentation about Deaf Roma children, Deaf Roma culture, etc.
Secondly, at the recent World Federation of the Deaf Conference, I've given a presentation and the audience was shocked. They never thought about deaf Roma women. They had many very negative ideas about Roma, uh, about Roma people. They were surprised to see a deaf Roma leader. And I told them, yes, I come from a, let's say a broken background, had no life in Kosovo because of traditional family values, cultural values. I've developed myself thanks to the teachings of my father. And I told them there are positive life stories about Roma people. There are Roma people who do have money, who do have a good family life, who are employed. And there are Roma people whose life is very hard, who work only under the table, etc. Then they asked me about Sinti, like, why are they travelers? And I told them, it's their culture, it's their tradition. Some people choose for a sedentary life to settle. Others choose to continue traveling. Both cultures need support. Both cultures need to get an opportunity to live as equal citizens. So the audience was really shocked. And I told them, well, we're equal like other people. In the world, there are several tribes, several races, several religions. We are one of you, but we are one of the most discarded groups, the most marginalized groups. But even within us, in this marginalized group, deaf people are lagging even more behind. So I was glad to have an opportunity to show them a positive deaf Roma story. So as I said, I've, given, I've been given an opportunity to lecture three times. Some people got enlightened, other people still don't get it. So that's work for me in the future. Um, can, I, can you show the next slide, please?
Okay, we have a change of the deaf interpreter team. See, see all interpreters are back. Go ahead, Ruga. Thank you, Damian. The video you've seen just shows a life story from Poland. They're people from Kosovo originally. No, sorry, they're Roma people. The documentary is called The Silent Queen. Because this girl is really pampered within the Roma family. So she's nicknamed the, the Silent Queen in this documentary. Now, what's the story? This deaf girl, woman, is uneducated, never attended school, was born in a family with very limited communication. Sure, the family gestured, but didn't know proper sign language. And this deaf girl learned to become a professional dancer. She learned traditional Indian dance, very traditional Roma culture. She cherished her DVD from Indian dance and learned from just watching the Indian dance. She practiced the moves and she was lucky to enter a hearing dance competition. And this silent queen, our deaf girl, entered the dance competition and won. She was given a degree. She couldn't read the certificate. And she didn't realize that this could be her key to a good future. She wasn't aware of herself as a deaf Roma woman. As a woman, girl, she was discriminated in, even within the family, physically abused. Her life is no good. So after this, after she won the award, she was given hearing aids. And the other hearing kids teased her, like, now you can hear. But she had no sound awareness. She did not understand what the hearing aids gave her. So she got rid of her hearing aids because they weren't of any use. She threw out the paper of the award she had won. And this is a life story of how many deaf Roma get lost from the hearing community, where they're already marginalized, but also from their deaf community. Many are not aware, have never met another Roma deaf person, just keep living in their tradition within the Roma cultures. Many deaf Roma people get lost. At the end, you see her going into a car. She entered this car, left Poland, 
and enter the deaf, enter the deaf school. And we don't know. Was she able to get educated, to graduate? The Rohir family still lives in Poland. She's the only one in Romania, and we do not know how her life went on. I hope with some support to find her again. She didn't know the importance of the certificates she won with the dance competition. She's probably abused by her hearing peers. She may end up on the streets being a pickpocket. So I really would like to see a European association established. So the deaf Roma kids can be enrolled in schools, get access to a language, to diplomas, to employment. But still many Roma kids are not involved in education. Are not involved in sport, deaf sports, are not involved in the EUDY, the European Union of Deaf Youth. Do not have, maybe have the access to technology, uh, to international sign, to the global deaf community. Are not aware or proud of their deafness. So I think I've come to my end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Can you show the final slide, please? Are there any questions? Okay, Damian, thank you so much for your presentation. Really powerful. Your life story, your achievements, a lot of respect. Now I want to open the floor for questions. I see none in the chat, so perhaps I can ask you some questions and you can respond to those. Arriva, sure. So we'll take it very slowly to give all deaf uh, interpreters an opportunity. So if you can all see me, you're right. Ruben, can you see me? Yes, I see you. Damian here. I have a question for you. You grew up in Kosovo, made it to Switzerland. Did you know about what did you know about Switzerland? In Kosovo, yes, we heard about Switzerland. I had a friend, a woman, Roma also, who had been to Switzerland, made friends there, found work there. She was invited by a deaf man to spend the holidays in Switzerland. One day he came to Kosovo and that was the first time I met somebody who'd lived in Switzerland. He, he told me, you have no future in Kosovo, girl. This life's bad here, come. In Switzerland, you have many more opportunities. So he promised to help me. We stayed in touch and he uh, got me to Switzerland for the first time and the rest of the story I've told you already. Thank you. 
your family, your father and mother, you're very grateful for what they gave you. They taught you many life lessons. Maybe they weren't able to uh, teach you literacy, but without their life lessons, would you have maybe stay in Kosovo? Yes. Especially my father. My father was involved, was an advocate in Kosovo, in politics. So he was a political activist. He taught me advocacy. He taught me to get educated, to graduate, and to become a politician advocating for deaf Roma. Without my father's life lessons, my life would have sucked. I would have stayed in Kosovo, not had any deaf Roma connections throughout Europe. So I'm very grateful, yes, for my father's life lessons. And now, if I look at my life now in Holland, I cannot forget my people. I cannot forget the Roma and Sinti people. I want to work to improve their lives and I want to thank my father for his life lessons. Without that, it would have been stuck in traditional cultural norms. My father really respected me as a woman and allowed me to become who I am. I don't see you anymore. Damian, I'll wait till Damian comes back. Uh, Dami is maybe uh, looking at his um, phone now to see if there were any questions. I'll just stay here and wait till Dami comes back with the next question. <laughs> 